Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Felici, the capital of Georgia, is rightly considered the tourist pearl of this country. Every year it attracts more and more tourists. Located on the banks of the Kura River, this city has a special charm that has attracted the hearts of people from all over the world. Here and the family of the famous businessman Stephen Otis went on a joint trip to the capital of Georgia. Staying in a beautiful hotel near the mountains, the Otis family has always been an example of prosperity and harmony. Stephen was happily married to his first university and love Adriana for over 20 years. The businessman's wife was a talented artist and was busy raising three children. The eldest was 18-year-old Nancy. The middle was 16-year-old Christopher, and the youngest was Princess Molly, who was barely six years old. Stephen and Adriana were not only loving parents, but also loyal friends to their children. They spent a lot of time together, traveling, visiting museums and theaters. There was an atmosphere of love, respect, and support in the Otis home. Every evening, the family gathered in their large two-story apartment. Around the big table, they shared all the news and plans for the future. The spouses taught their children to appreciate labor, to be responsible and kind. Nancy, Christopher and Molly grew up confident and ready for adulthood. The Otis family was happy and grateful to fate for giving them such wonderful children and a faithful friend in the form of a husband. They knew that together they could overcome any difficulties and achieve any goals. In one of the family evenings in the Otis dining room, they decided how to spend their vacation and where to go to languish in Moscow all summer nobody had a desire to go. They thought for a long time, and each of the adult members of the family offered different options. Nancy wanted to fly to Dubai, Christopher to Israel. Parents wanted to go somewhere closer to Abkhazia, Georgia or Dagestan. Mass started to object Adriana, Christopher, but what Dagestan? There's practically nothing to do there. What's interesting there? Fortresses, mosques, nature. The woman listed. Sightseeing is not enough for you. That's not interesting. I like my dad's suggestion to go to Georgia. I supported my parents' wish. Nancy, there's a lot to see there. How do you know? Asked my sister Christopher. You're not gonna believe what I googled. Showed her brother her phone with the results of Georgia's query. See what? You didn't even think to monitor all the suggestions. I'm gonna look too. Pull out your phone and make the necessary inquiries, said Christopher. And I'll tell you if I'm in for Georgia. You have five minutes to vote, said Stephen, and started the stopwatch on his wristwatch. Let's go, Tanishka, and I will clear the table in the meantime. Five minutes later, the older children decided to agree to the trip to Georgia. It remained only to think over the route where to fly to and what cities to visit. In the end, Otis decided to fly to Belize to devote two weeks of their trip to visit all the most cozy corners of the original and interesting city. They rent a car and set off on the Tel Aviv route. Signal Kakedi, ancient cave town of Plols. Scheme. When the Otis family prepared the necessary documents, settled all the things in the business, booked tickets and collected the necessary things for travel and rest. Little Molly did not forget to bring along her favorite toys. Their flight was due in the early morning, so they woke up before dark and headed to the airport. Upon arrival, they went through check-in and security check, after which they went to board the plane. When they boarded the plane, they were greeted by friendly flight attendants who helped them find their seats and explained the safety rules. Soon the plane took off and the Otis began their journey in the sky. During the flight, some slept, some looked out the window, and some watched movies and played games. But all Christopher, Molly, and Stephen with Adriana were enjoying the food that the stewards were offering. Little Molly enjoyed watching the clouds and marveling at the beauty of the earth from a bird's eye view, actively commenting to her daddy, what does she see? So, has the Stephen family spoken? We are back on solid ground and more exciting adventures await in the future. Hooray! The rest of the family shouted with glee as they passed the beginning of their journey with cheers of joy. From the airport, Otis went straight to the hotel, 
where they rented four rooms for two weeks and every day made trips to the city for excursions. The whole family noted that in Tbilisi modernity harmoniously combines with historical heritage, creating a unique atmosphere. Tourists enjoyed visiting ancient fortresses, temples and monasteries, which reminded of the past of Georgia, and with no less pleasure viewed modern skyscrapers, shopping centers and entertainment complexes, which made life in the capital of Georgia convenient and comfortable. Walking along the streets of Tbilisi, Nancy photographed the bright and colorful facades of houses decorated with folk ornaments and stucco. Stephen and Adriana appreciated the old town, where the famous northern baths, built in the 17th century and still popular with locals and visitors, are located. Christopher and Molly were most impressed by the Kura River embankment, where they were able to enjoy the beautiful views of the river and the city, and most importantly, to try Georgian cuisine in one of the many restaurants located on the embankment. When the city sites were over, the Otis family decided to go to the mountains to get a bird's eye view of Tbilisi. Nancy, who didn't want to go for fear of ruining her manicure and tearing things, had to be persuaded the longest. But Mama went back to begging Nancy, can't you spend your leisure time in a civilized way? What do you call civilized? Adriana asked her daughter to sit in the room or sleep on the phone, to go down to the table only. You're exaggerating again, mom, sighed Camille civilized. It's city tours, museums, a motorboat on the river Camille in the mountains, well, that sort of thing. You're grown-ups. You need it. And you're an adult too. The woman reminded me, soon to be 19. And you're acting like a spoiled teenager. You don't want to come with us, that's fine but you can't go alone in a foreign country. You're gonna sit in your room and wait for us. And it's clear you've planned a bed for the whole day, but we'll come back. And then we'll go for a walk along the night quay until the evening alone. Without jumping out of bed, Nancy began to gather. I'd better go with you. I don't want to puff myself up all by myself, but I'll have to redo my manicure. You will, Adriana smiled. Daddy paid for the course, and bought you everything you need for a reason. Get dressed quickly. You have 15 minutes to get ready. I'll meet you downstairs. An hour later, the Otis family was on their way to the bottom of the mountain. Motorcycle, which is part of the Sagittarius Ridge. There they were met by a guide who would take them to the top of the mountain to the highest point of Belize and tell them about the sights. A powerful path led the tourists to the elevator that would take them to the top. The tour guide was pouring out facts and interesting stories like from a cornucopia. Let me remind you that this is the highest point of Pelisi. The guide told us, as much as 740 meters above sea level. Excuse me, Nancy interrupted him. Why does it have that name? Does it translate somehow, I suppose? Yes, of course it does. The name of the mountain translates from Georgian as the Holy Mountain. Holy Mountain is Christopher. Yes, literally Holy Mountain. According to legend, the ascetic street David settled here in the 6th century. And in the 19th century, a stone church was built on the site of his prayer room. The guide continued the story. Around the church since 1929, there is a pantheon with numerous burial places of prominent people of Georgia, famous writers, artists, scientists, and national heroes. I understand, Stephen inserted a remark into the guide's monologue. The TV tower is at the very top. We will go to it, or go straight to the Turtle to Him Lake. The TV tower height of 275 meters was built in 1955 on the very top of the mountain. It can be seen from almost every corner of the city, and it is one of the symbols of Tbilisi. Excursion guide, stopping near the platform for cars, the funicular continued, there is also a park where we can go out and a restaurant. One of the walls of the restaurant is decorated with monumental frescoes and paintings dedicated to Pyrrhus Mani. We will climb up there as well and go to the lake. A leisurely ascent among beautiful nature took about 10 minutes. During it, Otis listened attentively to the guide, looked around with interest, and took lots of photos to save their memories in a photo album. Climbing to the top, they answered donuts in the cafe, 
cable car enjoyed the view of the city and walked around the park. After an hour, they headed to the other side of the mountain to reach the Turtles its lake. That's how they spent an unforgettable two-week vacation in Felicia as a family. But Parabola is going on a car tour through the ancient cities of Georgia to admire the nature and architecture of small towns and continue their acquaintance with this amazing country. Between Tel Aviv and Signal, the Otis family saw advertisements for several hiking trails through the mountains. They decided to stop and take part in one of the climbs, choosing a mountain that was not too high. After all, little Molly was completely unprepared. After making their way to one group, led by an experienced guide, they set off on a little hike through the mountain peaks in the expanse of Georgia, following a route that took them over cliff faces and glades with their warrior trees. Parents feared for their children's lives. And as, apparently, not for nothing Nancy liked to take crazy pictures, she got too close to the edge of the cliff and plummeted down so fast that no one had time to react. Nancy, all the family members screamed in unison. Stephen, saving her rather that with her Stephen, sobbing, rushed to the edge of the cliff. Adriana, Adriana, stop. Stephen grabbed his wife tightly. Stop, don't you dare look over there. A real panic and commotion ensued. Tourists gathered around. Unsuccessful mothers were screaming and wringing their hands. The younger children didn't know what to do. Frightened little Molly was sobbing uncontrollably, approaching cautiously to the edge of the cliff with several men who had called together to help. The head of the family felt an attack of bad luck, but then to his incredible relief, he saw that his daughter had by some miracle managed to cling to a sturdy looking bush that was growing out of a crevice in the cliff. If it wasn't for this horrifying accident now grabbing everyone's attention, one could admire the view from here. It was simply breathtaking. A valley spread out below, covered in a green carpet of grasses and bright patches of flowers. The air was clear and incredibly fresh, filled with the scent of mountain plants. The sky seemed to glow from within with a bright porcelain blue color without a single cloud of sunlight illuminating the valley, making it even more beautiful. The wind lightly moved the grass, creating waves on the sea of green. And not far from the cliff, sheep were grazing on a small plateau area. Honey, don't move. Stephen shouted, we're going to get you out of there. Somebody help me. What are you standing there for? We have to do something. We've already called the rescue team. Another tourist tried to calm the man down. Yeah, by the time they get here, my daughter could be down. But we can't get her out of there by ourselves. The guide said, no one has a rope. The sobs are yours, Adriana asked. Maybe we could toss it to my girl so she can untie it. And we'll pick her up. No, answered all the participants in the event in turn. All the while the other campers, the tour guide and Adriana, and the kids were trying to figure out how to save Nancy. Until the rescuers arrived, Stephen was thrashing around looking for real help and trying to talk to his daughter, who was sobbing with fear and afraid to move while everyone was thrashing around looking for a solution. A young lad nearby sheep herded the sheep. Seeing what a difficult situation the girl was in, decided to help. The pasture was covered with lush green grass, which softly sewed bodies under the feet of the guy, who moved towards the rock on which the accident occurred. The sheep were all the while grazing peacefully in the meadow, their white wool glistening in the sunshine. The shepherd was able to climb a ledge low off the ground, so that he could reach Nancy with a rope. He succeeded, but the girl was so frightened that she did not know what to do with the rope, especially since she didn't have enough space. The tourist guide and the girl's parents watched the young man from above, who began to climb up the practically allotted rock Helena. The ascent was difficult and dangerous. The rock was so steep and slippery that the young man's boots could barely hold on for longer than two seconds on small exposures. But he kept climbing, clinging to ledges and cracks in the rock. His hands and feet trembled with exertion, but he did not give up. At last, after much effort, the lad managed to reach the bush on which Nancy was stuck. He obliged the already exhausted by her screams and fear victim, 
and climbed higher to pass the rope to the standing men. The further ascent was even more difficult and proved no easy test for the shepherd. The surface of the rock was uneven and covered in small cracks, making every step dangerous. Despite this, he kept moving upward, overcoming fear and fatigue. His hands were slipping on the smooth surface of the rock, but he persevered on his way to the safe path where he was eagerly awaited. Finally, by the combined efforts of his father, the guide, the young man, and several male hikers, the distressed Nancy was pulled out. My dear, shaking hands with his daughter's savior and hugging him tightly almost crying, said Stephen. Thank you so much for saving our treasure. Ask for anything you want. Any amount will pay it all. Thank you. I'm fine. The young man was embarrassed. I'm glad I could help. And I'm happy I did. Now I must go before my herd scatters all over the plateau. Goodbye, our savior. Adriana hugged the boy goodbye. With tears of joy. Goodbye. The young man said goodbye to everyone and disappeared from sight around a dangerous corner. What a noble lad, said Nancy Stephen's mother. He should be thanked anyway. Tanya interrupted Stephen's wife. Now we must think of a way to bring her daughter to her senses. I'll deal with this shepherd later. Yes, of course, agreed Adriana. Take Christopher and Molly, hold their hands. Do not let them out until we come down from this stupid mountain. Otis, the head of the family, gave instructions and I'll carry the cash in my arms. There's an ambulance waiting for you at the bottom, the tour guide remarked, and I'll go with you to help and back you up on the descent. Thank you. Thank the man, taking Nancy in his arms. He commanded, let's go. Of course, none of the Otis continued after all the events, a car tour through the towns of Georgia. They returned to Belisi to the hotel where they had stayed earlier. There Nancy spent several days under the care of a private doctor. The girl lay on her bed, drowning in soft change. Her long hair was spread over the pillow, and her face was lightly touched with a blush. She was dressed in a light white shirt, which beautifully lightened her slender figure. The room during the day was always flooded with sunlight, the rays of which penetrated through the open window, filling the air with warmth and coziness. On the wall opposite the bed hung a painting of a mountain landscape. This subject later on reminded the victim very much of what had happened. Eventually, she took it down and put it away. Coming to her senses, Nancy settled down to recall all the events that had taken place that day. For from the shock it seemed to her as if none of it had been real, as if it had not been with her. But she knew that her life had almost been cut short on that stupid slope for wanting to take a cool picture. Mom told Camille about her rescuer, who was on a tip from nearby. We wanted to thank him, Mom shared with her, but he said he didn't need anything. Dad tried to give him an envelope with a small amount, but he handed it back. I want to thank him myself, Nancy said confidently. Where can I find him? What's his name? Nancy, dear, he has a very interesting name, Rick, and he's not hard to find, not far from his father. He grills kebabs for tourists in the countryside and herds his sheep. But first, you have to get your strength and eat, Adriana warned. The next morning, without informing her parents, but only leaving a note in the room, Nancy went in search of her savior. On the way, she bought a small souvenir, a bottle of Vegiani wine. The girl very quickly found the parking lot of her savior, and when she hesitantly froze quite close, she could make out the young man who had pulled her through the abyss. Rick appeared to be a man with a distinctly Georgian appearance. Tall, slender, with dark hair and slightly swarthy skin. When he turned in her direction, Nancy glared at his eyes, which had an unusually deep dark color, almost black. Hello, was all Nancy could utter. Both answered in their native language, Rick. What can I do for you? I'm you. The girl was confused. You don't remember me. A couple days ago, you saved me. I fell off a cliff and a beautiful stranger smiled and a guy, for the rescue of which everyone wants to hand me money. I'm glad you're okay, but I'm not going to change my mind about the financial reward. Every self-respecting man would do the same. My name is Nancy. The girl blushed. 
and I didn't come for that. Or rather, I came to thank you for saving me. But I didn't bring money. I brought wine. They say it's very tasty. I thought you might like to accept such a modest gift from a rescued person. Nice to meet you. Nancy. My name is Rick. But you obviously already know that from the wine. Thank you. Chuckles. It's my pleasure. Would you like a kebab? I'd love one. While Rick prepared the necessary ingredients, sliced the meat, forgot our puree, and set them on the brazier, Nancy was chopping onions and spooning billy sauce over the meat to make it more succulent. As we talked, the young man kept making sure the meat didn't burn but was still good about roasting, and in doing so, he never stopped sharing stories from his life. Nancy listened avidly to Rick's pleasant, deep, and richly toned timber, which seemed to nod to the girl. The young people had long ago switched to you and were telling each other about themselves and eating freshly fried kebabs with great appetite. By the middle of the conversation, Nancy suddenly realized that she had fallen in love. And Rick, as if nothing had happened, continued to talk about his life. I live here in the Foothills, and only in the summer. My parents worked hard, and I grew up with an uncle, and who had no family of his own. He is now almost 70 years old. Bid Zena. It's hard. Housekeeping. So here I am helping out as and when I can bat. He he threw Nancy. That means uncle in Georgian. Smiled back Rick. Sometimes I have native Georgian words and expressions in my speech. Although I speak more Russian. I even study at a Russian-speaking university. Which one? Where? And for whom? I asked a young man a lot of questions. Nancy, you don't think I'm prying. I'm just curious. I still haven't decided what I want to study. My parents gave me a year to decide. I'm studying at the Faculty of Humanities at Tbilisi State University. Believe me, I didn't choose where I got into school. You only help your uncle in the summer. And I live in a dormitory. But soon I'll graduate and I hope to find a job close to home to keep helping him. And I myself like to take care of pledges, chickens, and other household chores. Tell me about your life as a student. Asked chewing another piece of fried meat. I'm very interested. Student life is full of adventures and interesting events or innovations began the story Rick. Every day becomes a new challenge for us. So everyone stared fearfully at the guy, perplexed Nancy. No, of course not, laughed the shepherd. I'm just kidding. But we do have adventures, although it's more of a quest. What kind of quest? Who has time to bathe before the couples? Generally the showers, which is one for the whole floor. Rick started listing off by twiddling his thumbs, then whether you can have breakfast, because someone might have already eaten your food or burned the kettle. Bloody hell. That's all the girl could say but you get used to it quickly. It's very interesting at university. We socialize a lot with friends, with classmates, play computer games, and I often read books. You can participate in various student clubs and activities, which helps you develop your skills and knowledge. I like to read too. I even dream of writing. I don't know yet though. Nancy shared her thoughts. What exactly are you reading? But I really like John. Without thinking, answered Rick. Well, and Russian classics I read. I'm interested in that too. I was especially impressed by Dostoevsky. And you have a favorite book. I'm a book music lover, said Nancy. I read everything that I like and interested in the annotations, but more often it's detectives, fantasy, novels, but not love, but family sagas, for example. And my favorite is a banal book master and Margarita. Everyone knows it now. Yeah, it's incredibly popular, and I'm cool with it. I have another favorite book, Perfumer. The story of one murderer, shared by a girl and Jane Eyre. These three books I collect in different editions and translations. Good choices, great literary taste, praise Rick. As for me, I can't collect a big library yet. But as soon as I graduated from college and settled either in my parents' house or in my uncle's, I realized my dream to collect the entire collection of books by Sergei Lukianenko. Wonderful plans, said Camille, raising her glass. 
We should drink to the realization of dreams. Let's drink to dreams that should come true. Rick won the hearts of a young metropolitan girl who had never seen such a handsome, intelligent, and brave man. When he decided to walk Nancy to the hotel, the girl agreed. Almost reaching the hotel, she confessed her sympathy to the young man. Rick was not averse to having an affair with a beautiful young Russian woman, so he offered her to meet tomorrow and go on a date. Happy and elated Nancy returned to the hotel in high spirits, where her angry parents, who could not contact her all day, were waiting for her. After all, the glossless had left her cell phone in her room. The young couple met in secret. Nancy was afraid to tell her parents that she was in a relationship with a Georgian. She had to come up with ridiculous excuses not to go to dinner with her family or not to participate in excursions. But the date of their departure arrived. The day before, Rick and Nancy exchanged contacts and promised to write and call each other constantly. The rest of the summer and the whole fall the lovers spent at a distance. They were constantly video calling and texting every minute of the day. On winter vacation, Nancy decided to come to her beloved in Polisi, but she came up with a completely different story for her parents. What was it? Surprised Adriana. When the daughter announced her plans for the winter holidays, ski resort Nancy told us, in Adigia and Krasnodar region Lisa, and I want to go skiing for a week two young beautiful girls. Tried to talk my daughter Stephen out of going. One will go to hell to go skiing. Unthinkable. You think it over. I'm not talking to Lisa. She has her own parents. But we're not done with you yet. But dad started to whine and pity Nancy. Her parents are letting her go. And I'm stuck here like a schoolgirl in front of you, going to a night disco. We'll get rooms. We'll be supervised by instructors. It's a gated community. I promise we won't go off base. Crazy. All right, mom agreed, with the condition that you stay in touch at all times. Thanks, mommy, I will. No one asks me, as usual, spotted me by the bullet. Well, please, okay, waved in the direction of his daughter Otis. But keep mommy's condition. What can I do with you? You're gonna be 19 soon. You're Miss Independent. Thank you very much. Nancy hugged her father. I'll run to the Mariinsky and pack my bags. Don't you need to buy tickets? Adriana asked. I already bought them. I knew you would agree. Sending a kiss from the stairs, the girl ran to her room. The girl very quickly got ready for the road, persuaded Lisa to fly with her, but only to Georgia, not to moisture. And happy on January 1, she flew with her friend to Belisi. Rick met them there, joyful and madly in love with his girlfriend. The friend settled in a separate room, but when her parents called, Nancy was always near, creating the necessary alibi. And in the rest of the time the girl was walking, getting acquainted with the city and national peculiarities on her own. After all, Nancy did not leave her beloved not a step away. Rick decided to show the girl in the capital of Georgia what they had not seen with their parents in one of the evenings, when the sun was slowly descending over Tbilisi, enveloping the city in a golden pink glow and the city walls, decorated with ancient frescoes and mosaics, sparkled in the rays of the setting sun like precious stones. The boy led Nancy through the narrow streets of the city. They walked leisurely, holding hands. Among the ancient buildings and ancient churches they strolled, inhaling the fragrance of blossoming trees and listening to the birds singing. The lovers were like two parts of one whole, perfectly complementing each other. He was tall and slender with hair the color of raven, winged and graceful, and delicate. With long curls Nancy's eyes glowed with love and joy as she looked at Rick. That evening they passed by small cafes and restaurants where the locals were enjoying their evening out, sipping flavored coffee and eating delicious and Georgian dishes. The lovers stopped to buy fresh fruit and sweets from the street vendors. As they strolled through the old town, they noticed a group of musicians playing traditional instruments. Rick and Nancy stopped to listen to the music and enjoy the atmosphere of old Tbilisi. The next day, they decided to go to the botanical garden for a picnic, and tonight they danced under the stars, accompanied by street musicians, 
enjoying each other's company. In the morning, Rick and Nancy bought hot chakrapuri and lemonade and went to the botanical gardens for a picnic. The landscape of the botanical garden in Palisi impressed the young lady very much. It is more like a big forest in a canton surrounded by mountains. She said to her young man as she walked past several ponds with frogs. After looking at the waterfalls and stopping and sitting down on the grass near the stream, how beautiful it is here, close your eyes and take in the atmosphere of this wonderful place, said Nancy. You can hardly hear the sounds of the city here. Yes, agreed Rick. It's a place of strength for me. I like to come here, find a cozy corner and have a little picnic. We, by the way, as long as we walked, never once saw a single cafe and you won't find one here. At several tropics you can meet vending machines with water and soda, shared information about his favorite place Tobas. This place is still a bit original and the authorities do not want to spoil the landscape of the garden. We do not meet such a thing in Moscow, laughed. If there is a park, square, garden and so on, there is bound to be a cafe, restaurant or small stores with ready-to-eat food. I know. I was in the Russian capital a couple of times with my parents. I didn't really like it. Why such a big city? So many places to visit. Nancy wondered. It's too noisy, too crowded, and the subway. Rick laughed. I've never quite figured it out. You haven't been to Street Petersburg yet, said the girl. Tell me, where will we go tomorrow? And the day after tomorrow before we leave, do you have plans? Yes, of course. Rick said mysteriously, let's eat, or the chakapuri will get cold. The next day, the couple spent almost the whole day in the room watching movies and eating junk food. And in the evening, having put on comfortable shoes, Rick took Nancy to the Tabora Monastery. It was not crowded to watch the sunset at the temple, and from the observation deck, there was a beautiful view of small and charming Tbilisi. And the next evening before departure, Rick proposed to the girl in a restaurant, quietly having dinner and enjoying each other's company. The young people reached the dessert. What was Nancy's amazement when instead of ordering a new Anna Pavlova cake, she was brought a red velvet box on her plate. At that moment, Rick got down on one knee in front of the girl. Whose are you the meaning of my life? The guy started his speech, confused in languages. I don't have enough words in Russian and Georgian languages to express all the feelings I have near you. Sweetheart, become mine forever. Make me happy. Marry me. I will, exclaimed happy Nancy. I do, I, I do, agreed Rick. Putting the ring on her finger, her lover kissed her and lifted her in his arms, encircling her, and then asked her to dance. Against the background of their idol, and sounded a small restaurant orchestra, which created an atmosphere of love, tranquility, and happiness. So ended an unforgettable week for the couple in love, and began a new story engaged Nancy and Rick at the airport, saying goodbye. They knew that they parted for a short time, because the girl decided to immediately tell her parents about everything. Upon arrival in Moscow, the friends said goodbye and got into different cabs. The driver Nancy turned on a quiet, soothing music, which helped the girl to relax a little and forget about all the problems and worries. As they drove through the night city, Nancy looked at the twinkling lights and thought about how beautiful the capital was. Finally, after a short but pleasant ride, they pulled up to the girl's house. The cab driver helped unload the luggage and said good night. Nancy, thanking him for the wonderful ride, paid for his services. Having gone up to her floor, she opened the door of the apartment and breathed in the familiar cozy smell of her native home. I won't tell them anything today. Nancy thought, hugging her parents. All the talking in the morning. Family. Joyful and disembodied Nancy flew into the dining room. I have wonderful news for you. So anxious to know what his daughter's news was on getting married. The girl blurted out. I mean Christopher choked on his tea. Nancy, what kind of joke is that? Adriana gasped in surprise. Who is he? Asked the father. It's not a joke. Putting her hand up and showing her ring, Nancy replied. My fiancé Rick. We have been together for a long time, 
and we love each other. Is this the shepherd who saved you? Asked the brother. Yes, he is. I went to thank him and couldn't part with him. After we left, we stayed in touch all the time. And on New Year's Eve, I decided to visit him. So you didn't go to see him? Mom asked. No. I went to Polisi again, but I was really with Lisa. I didn't know how you would feel about the fact that I went there, so I lied a little. But I have a little decency started to tell off my daughter Stephen. And the fact that you are together and that he proposed to you is an even bigger lie. Sweetie turned to Nancy the mom. He's Georgian. Are you ready to be a Muslim? Mom. In Georgia, the main religion is the Orthodox Church. We were told about it on the tours, but it's still weird. She's a big girl, let her decide for herself. We're not thrilled, but he seems like a nice guy. Invite Rick and his parents over. Nancy squealed with joy, threw herself on her father's neck, and smacked her parents on the cheek, and rushed off to call her fiancé with the news and an invitation to come over. Rick agrees with the bride's parents and decides to come with his parents. In two weeks, they will return from a business trip and stay in Moscow to wait for their son from Georgia. The long-awaited day came when the son's parents were to meet at the Moscow airport early in the morning. Robert, Kevin, and Miranda drove to the airport to meet Rick. Although they were excited, the parents tried to stay calm and not show their emotions. When they saw him in the arrivals, all their hearts sank with happiness. Rick ran up to them, and the parents hugged the young man tightly. Unable to hold back tears of joy when everyone calmed down a bit, the trio went to a restaurant to have lunch, share the news of the last year they hadn't seen each other, and discuss their upcoming introduction to their future in-laws. Rick was the first to speak, the head of the family. Tell us about the girl and her parents. We don't know anything. Yes, my boy. Miranda supported the father. You really surprised us with the wedding and meeting the parents. Do you remember that I told you that I saved a girl who fell off a cliff near the plateau where I was herding my uncle's sheep? Yes. The parents responded with glee. So she and I started hanging out, Rick continued. And after a while we started dating. But then they moved away. But we kept in touch by phone and video. And times. Robert, Kevin, and HIV love long distance through the phone and to meet in real life to go get a sweetheart. But we met a few months later on New Year's vacation in Felici. Rick gasped with surprise at the young man's mother. The girl came to you, not you to her. It happened that way. She suggested it, and I agreed. Blurred eyes, replied the young man. But after a week together, I realized that I did not want to let her go and made her an offer. You asked for money for that. Yes, continued Rick. After the proposal, Nancy went home and told her parents about our engagement. And they, in turn, invited us all over to meet her. And here we are, Robert Marlowe stated. And here you are. I'll call Camille and see if they're expecting us or if they're not ready yet. Okay, after looking at the menu, Miranda decided to order. I'm gonna grab a cup of coffee. We met the family at the Otis apartment. The whole family fussed on the bed on the table and preparing for the upcoming acquaintance. Nancy was anticipating the meeting with her beloved, not thinking about how this acquaintance of parents would go. She spent almost the entire morning in front of the mirror, examining her reflection. From there, a young, beautiful, slender brown woman whose green eyes shone with intelligence and kindness looked back at the girl. Nancy styled her long hair so that it fell over her shoulders in soft waves. It took her a long time to decide what to wear and in the end, she chose a dark blue dress with a deep neckline in the back and short sleeves. Only the dress was decorated with delicate lace, which emphasized her thin waist, and the skirt was lush and long, which gave the girl an additional grace and elegance. Hearing the intercom ringing and her mother shouting that guests were on their way, Nancy was quickly caught up. On her neck, a graceful necklace of white gold with diamonds, which complemented her image, and in her ears on the move inserted small earrings, carnations with the same diamonds. 
The image of the girl was completed with elegant shoes, loafers, which she managed to put on right before the front doors opened. And since he was dressed with a needle, he was wearing a classic suit, obviously sewn to individual order. Leather shoes on his feet, his face was smoothly shaved, and his hair was neatly styled. The young Georgian was smiling, and his smile was so sincere and warm that it was impossible not to smile back. He looked at Nancy with love and respect. Barely crossing the threshold, he greeted his parents. His lover gave flowers to Stephen, and Adriana shook his hand. There was silence in the apartment for a second. And then there was a sound of ice cream for the kids, ice cream for his grandmother, flowers. Be careful not to confuse Kutuzov. After this quote, the space exploded with ringing laughter from everyone present. Once everyone had calmed down, Rick corrected the errors of his greeting and introduced his parents and Nancy hers. Then everyone made their way to the table. A huge table was set up in the living room, left with a variety of dishes. Adriana had made sure that everyone was comfortable and no one would go hungry. That's why there were traditional Georgian kakapuri, lamb kebab, homemade pickles, and much more. Even though the Otis family was very friendly, open, and outgoing, and the Marlowe family was more reserved and reserved, they still managed to find a common language. The women talked about their hobbies and shared food recipes, and the men joked a lot and talked about fishing. The younger Otis children felt out of place, surrounded by adults who were having a great time talking amongst themselves, and the older sister couldn't help but admire her lover. So Christopher and Molly went to their father's study after dinner to watch TV there. Toward the end of the evening before dessert was served, Adriana called the younger Otis to the table. As the woman brought out the cake, topped gracefully with flower petals and brightly colored fruit, Molly slipped her tights clad feet onto the tile and fell right under her mother's feet. What happened next was like a slow motion movie. Adriana managed to stay on her feet, but was blown over by the cake. It flew over Molly, through the poof and landed on the floor doing several flips in the air. Everyone was scared for the little girl, who was making strange noises. But rushing to her, the parents heard Molly laughing, smearing cream and dessert sprinkles all over her face. And the cake was really good. Smiling, Molly said, licking her fingers. Now I'm like a sweet dessert too. After examining the girl and realizing that she was all right, everyone exhaled and looking at the brown stain. Flying petals from the bridge and grimy six-year-old girl began to laugh. On that happy note, the families laughed the rest of the evening, exchanged gifts, blessed the children with marriage, and promised to support each other in times of need. Rick and Nancy could not be happy with this outcome and did not let go of each other's hands all evening. When Robert, Kevin, and Miranda and their son left, Nancy's parents began to clean the table and mop the floor, trying to clean up the chocolate already under the juice. Adriana and Stephen, having sent the children to bed, for some time discussed the previous evening and thought about what kind of wedding to organize for the young people. We'll talk to Nancy in the morning, said the head of the family. It's not for us to marry them to decide. Nancy started talking to her daughter, Adriana. We really liked Rick's family and he was at his best when he rescued you. Yeah, Stephen stepped in, a well-mannered boy and parents. Good for them, but they're traveling a lot. They don't know much about their son, but it's a good impression. We're going to apply tomorrow, Nancy said. What kind of wedding in April? Mom asked. It's cold, it's raining. We'll only celebrate in a restaurant. There's no off-site registration in the countryside. Mom interrupted Adriana's daughter's monologue. We don't want all that tinsel with the restaurant, the ransom, and everything. What do you want? The father decided to ask his daughter. Rick and I just want to get married in beautiful suits, have a small photo shoot just for two, and fly to Belize to the mountains. In a dreamy voice, Nancy told of her wedding plans. And what about me and this sweetheart? What about Christopher and Molly? Adriana asked. What about our memories of our happiest day, our loved ones? Adriana, stop pushing your daughter. 
interrupted his wife Stephen. They want to modestly sign and fly away. Then that's what we want, too. I'll pay for you any dress you want and help with the trip. At least we'll be able to go to the registry office. Barely audible, Mom asked. Of course, at the registry office, Rick and I are waiting for all our nearest and dearest, hugging her parents, said Nancy. Thank you for your love. Filing to register their marriage the next day, Nancy and her friend Lisa went in search of a magical wedding dress. Don't look at the price, her father texted. Pick the one you like. The girls went around many stores and boutiques, but could not find what they needed. Finally, in one of the bridal salons, the girls saw a dress that immediately caught their attention. Nancy said to Lisa with a gasp, This is your dress. I don't see any other on you. Go a model bride, listened to her friend, especially since she herself liked the dress very much. The consultant helped the girl to get dressed, and when the curtain opened in front of Lisa's gaze, Nancy appeared in an elegant wedding dress. The corset dress was adorned with a beautiful train and a shimmering bottom. The puffy skirt was adorned with a wide ribbon, which made the fragile image of the young bride chic and at the same time very delicate. Her friends were amazed at how well the dress looked on Nancy. Her green eyes sparkled and her brown hair complemented the look perfectly and blended perfectly with the cream color of the dress. It was the very dress the girls were looking for, paying for the purchase with Daddy's card. The friends went to shoe and jewelry stores to put together the entire wedding look. With makeup and hairstyle, we'll not have to worry. Lisa graduated from makeup artist training and moonlighted as a makeup artist by picking up women for various events on the wedding day. From early in the morning, the Otis home was bustling with activity. The parents were waiting for the groom's family, and the bride and her friend were getting ready for their room when their parents arrived. Stephen went to get his daughter to bring her down from the second floor of the apartment to the groom's room. When Nancy and her father appeared at the top of the stairs, Rick gasped. The bride was wearing a beautiful dress that emphasized her figure. The long train was held carried by Lisa and Molly. The girl's hair was styled in a beautiful updo, from which a few strands were released. Street these strands framed, and white face, which was decorated delicately. Makeup in hand, Nancy held a bouquet of flowers that matched her dress perfectly. The bride looked very happy and smiled at all the relatives. Her eyes glistened with joy, and her cheeks were ruddy with excitement. The marriage registration took place in Shipilov and the registry office itself. It attracted the newlyweds by the fact that it had a spacious registration hall and was conveniently located near the Terracino Park, where they were to have a photo shoot. Guests congratulated the young ones when they came out of the registry office doors, pelted them with flowers, and gave them gifts. In Serracino Park, you can feel like in a fairy tale. There is everything here for a romantic and beautiful wedding photo session of Rick and Nancy. They shot against the background of flowering gardens, picturesque ponds on elegant bridges, and in cozy grids next to antique columns and sculptures. Bright and emotional photos of the newlyweds were taken. On the same day, the newlyweds went on a wedding trip to the mountains. However, not to Belize as planned, but to Austria. The tourist brochure promised an unforgettable variety of hikes. Nancy and Rick decided that they would walk along the trails along the river, occasionally taking the Penguin Elevator to gain more than 1,000 meters in altitude. And they also agreed to make time for the main attraction of Meyer, Hoffman, Berlin, Rachel Hen, Vigo. This is the name of the Berlin High Altitude Route which is an eight-day walk from hut to hut, during which tourists have the opportunity to explore the high alpine scenery of the Zeeler Nature Park and spend the night at the end of each leg of the journey in a hut. It seemed convenient to the newlyweds, and the fact that from each point there is a route back to the valley, if suddenly they do not like something. After landing at the airport and getting to the hotel, Nancy called her parents, and told them about their joint plans to hike the 16th and 17th century Berlin route. She warned that the couple would be out of touch in places, but as soon as she had a chance, she would be sure to let her parents know. Two days later, Rick and Nancy went on an eight-day hike on the high mountain trail, 
from where the newlyweds never called Stephen and Adriana, who could not find a place for fear for their daughter. But remembering what Rick is capable of, how selflessly he once saved Nancy, decided to wait for news. But they got the news only when the daughter reported in a text message that she was coming home, and the number of her flight-excited parents went to the airport and immediately saw in the passengers their distraught spruce and daughter, and her husband was not around, apparently was not, shouted Nancy. Stephen and Adriana rushed towards their daughter, who burst into tears when she saw her parents. Dad and Mom could not get a word out of the girl, so they decided to go home and there try to calm and talk to her. At home, finally, Nancy was able to tell her relatives what had happened on the wedding trip. We went to 19th century Berlin, occasional sobs. Nancy was talking. Two points we passed successfully. We were happy. At some point I realized something was wrong with Rick. He was ill. Adriana impatiently interrupted her daughter. No, replied Nancy. I wish he was sick. He just pulled away from me. And on the third day, when we were to continue to the fourth hut, I did not find my husband in our room. I first wanted to go look for him outside, but then I saw a note that he had gone. Where had he gone? Dad asked. Just gone sobbing, said Nancy. Nothing more was said. I decided to turn off the highway and go back to the hotel. There I found that Rick had already been there, packed his things and withdrew all the money from his card. What money? The one I gave you for your wedding. Yeah. And the money I had before the wedding. Nancy ended her story sadly. What a rascal. And you decided to come back right away. Consoling her daughter. Adriana asked. We should report him. We should report him. Stephen resented him. No. Nancy exclaimed. We're not gonna file a report on anybody. If all he wanted from me was money. I'd learned to throw myself in the deep end, but I can't believe it. He looked at me with such love. Before she could finish her sentence, she burst into tears. Honey, Adriana said, hugging her daughter tightly. Stephen walked out of the room, leaving his wife and daughter from them. He was in a rage. The man decided to call the saints to find out what this behavior of their son was, why he had committed such a despicable act. Dialing Robert, and barely waiting for the matchmaker to pick up the phone, he began to straighten things out. Stephen abruptly interrupted his Marla monologue. Wait, I don't know what you're talking about. What did your son do? Having calmed down a little, continued the conversation. Stephen Otis left his wife at the resort and ripped her off. What? Where do you get such information about a daughter who is hysterical, who was able to return home only because she had some money in cash, who was left alone in a strange country. Nervously replied Nancy's father. That can't be true. Robert Kevin said absent-mindedly. He phoned just yesterday, saying how they were having a great time on their own. But that means he's having a great time with some other Camille, said Stephen Riley. Because our Nancy at home is devastated by your son's behavior. I'll look into it, Marlowe promised. I'll find out where Rick is, and why he stole money from your daughter. We're very sorry this happened, but honey and I don't know what happened. Our son truly loves your daughter. I see Stephen has decided to stop talking. Deal with your son, but don't let me see him in my house until he decides to apologize and return the money. Nancy didn't leave the apartment for a month. Christopher tried not to hit on his sister, and little Molly wanted to cheer her up, but she couldn't do it. After another two weeks, the girl began to feel nauseous. Otis first thought it was stress and malnutrition. But Nancy noticed on the woman's calendar that she was three weeks late. She asked her mom to buy a pregnancy test, informing her of the delay and taking a test the evening and morning of the next day. Nancy saw two bright red stripes on the white small cardboard. Mom called out through the closed bathroom door, and Nancy was confirmed. What to do? Nancy, whatever do you decide to keep the baby or not? Adriana answered her daughter. We have to go to the doctor, get an ultrasound and find out the time frame, and then make a decision. Sign me up for breakfast. Okay, sweetie. And don't tell anyone yet. I asked Nancy. She looked out the door. Not daddy, not my brother and sister. 
It was a deal. The next day, she and her mom went to the private clinic where their gynecologist was waiting for them. She was asked to lie down on the couch. A special gel was applied and a monitor was turned on, on which a special scanner reflects the uterus where the doctor can see the pregnancy. Congratulations, Nancy. With a smile on her face, said the doctor, you have a match and a pregnancy. I'm eight to nine weeks along, which is consistent with your delay. I can still get an abortion asked Nancy. In principle, yes, up to 12 weeks, it's possible. But I wouldn't advise surgical intervention at that stage. There are risks. There's already a heartbeat. Adriana just asked. Turn it on. Let him listen to it. Yeah, sure. The gynecologist answered without taking her eyes off the monitor. Your baby is within the normal range of 140 beats per minute. Listen to this. And in those heartbeats, Nancy heard her baby telling her that he was alive and wanted to be born. It's like my mom knew I couldn't have an abortion if I heard my baby's heart beating, thought pregnant, letting some mucus out. Back home, they reported the pregnancy to Stephen, who was shocked and didn't know how to react. But he supported his daughter, who was already in a state of shock. And in the first stage of depression, parents decided to send their daughter for treatment for depression in a sanatorium. Prudently negotiated the form of treatment taking into account Nancy's pregnancy. The girl was brought to the sanatorium for three weeks. The Otis family rented an apartment not far from the facility so that they would not leave their daughter alone and would be close by even if they could not see Nancy. When they checked the girl into the sanatorium, the head doctor told them that there were two psychiatrists, two psychotherapists, two rehabilitation physicians, and two clinical psychologists working in the unit designed to treat depressive spectrum disorders. We also had nurses, along with the initial secondary medical education and experience in medicine for at least five years, have a higher psychological education, proudly reported the chief doctor. There is also a procedural nurse, a nurse, a hostess, a social worker, and a maid to clean the wards. Nancy uncomplainingly agreed to the treatment, hoping to recover before she gave birth. As she checked into her local room and sorted out some of her belongings, she stood at the window and looked out at the beautiful landscape, green trees, blue sky, and bright sunshine. Her room was small but cozy. She had everything she needed for a comfortable three-week stay, a bed, a nightstand, a closet, and a dressing table. There were paintings of nature on the walls, which added to the coziness. The room even had its own bathroom with a shower and a small washing machine. There was a knock on the door to inform them that there was breakfast waiting for Nancy in the dining room. Going there, she chose an omelet, yogurt, fruit, and coffee. After eating, Nancy decided to take a walk around the grounds. There is still time before the appointment with the attending physician. Lulu thought, leaving the tray near the kitchen and thanking the dining room staff. The territory of the sanatorium was fenced and was very beautiful and well-maintained. There were Camille with trees, flower beds with flowers, fountains, and gaze bows for relaxing. Camille walked around Camille, enjoyed the fresh air, and listened to the birds singing not thinking at that moment about anything but the child who was now in her womb. What should she do? How to raise the baby? Would she be able to cope with it? These were the questions that Nancy was asking herself every day, adding more negativity to her condition. Suddenly, the phone vibrated in her pocket, announcing that it was time for her to go to the doctor's office. The doctor's office was only small, but cozy. The walls were painted light blue, and the floor was covered with linoleum already yellowed from sunlight. In the center of the room stood a table, on which were medical documents and some medicines. Next to the table was a cabinet with books on medicine. On the wall hung posters with pictures of the human body and its organs. I wonder, she thought, why he needs the internal structure of the body if they are more brain right. She listened to the doctor in half an ear occasionally nodding her head and trying to absorb his speech, which just poured in a huge stream. Our sanatorium provides a full range of therapeutic procedures for people with depression, 
recovering the body after severe stress. Digging through the documents, doctor, treatment of depression in the sanatorium is carried out according to a special program, which includes diet, hospital, therapy, physiotherapist, physical therapy. Rehabilitation after depression will not only restore your psychological balance, but also bring back the brightness of colors in life. Good mood of joy, positive outlook, especially since you're about to become a mother. On a diet, I will not sit down, gave voice Nancy and I. I've already lost a lot of weight, and I don't eat unhealthy and I'm satiated with small amounts of food. Well made a note in the chart. Sick, lying down. What about physical therapy? Gentle, of course. I agree, she sighed. If you think it will help me, it should. But most importantly, it should help you. A change of lifestyle, a change of residence, temporary. And no one will remind you of your depression after we meet. You're just resting in a sanitarium. I'm not getting any medication. No. Looking into Nancy's eyes, the attending physician answered, your condition can be normalized without medication. At least I think so. Especially since you're pregnant. We wouldn't risk it. Thank you for your answers. I was the only patient who thanked me for my understanding. I thought it would be much worse and that I would get nagged for being depressed. We're professionals. And when a person is really depressed, there's a good reason for it. And we don't know many of yours. And personally, I don't see anything wrong with that happening to you do you. Thank you. Almost in a whisper said Camille, who still thought that she was not behaving appropriately to the situation. Here's your spa book. There is your treatment. And here, opening the penultimate page, the doctor pointed to the top line of your schedule of sessions with the psychologist. No one insists. And if you don't show up, no one will scold you. But if I were you, I'd go at least a couple times. I will. On her way out, Nancy said goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Nancy. You'll come to see me on your last day, too. I'll prepare the discharge. All right, thank you. After these words, the door closed behind the girl. But the attending doctor looked at her for some time, thinking about Nancy's difficult life situation and sympathizing with her. While Nancy was being treated for depression in the sanatorium, the girl's parents and brother and sister were also vacationing in Kislovodsk, constantly walking and taking part in many excursions. Otis did not have enough vocabulary to describe to her friends all the beauty of Kislovodsk. Masha was telling her friend Adriana that Kislovodsk is a famous resort of the Caucasus. Since the 19th century, it has been attracting tourists with its picturesque views, clean mountain air, and of course, its famous mineral water, Narzan. Everyone comes here to improve their physical and spiritual health. The friends listened with great pleasure about the famous resort. They looked at photos and watched video stories. National Park in Kislovodsk made a great impression on everyone. The largest city park in his. Adriana had to answer a lot of questions from her friends, telling interesting facts she had heard from the guide. Its creation began back in the first half of the 19th century and continued with varying success in the following 100 years. Stony banks were made fertile by black soil and plant seedlings were imported from different parts of Eurasia, including Crimea, the Carpathians, and Georgia, the woman quoted the guide as saying. As the territory expanded, the park was divided into lower, middle, and upper ones, each with its own unique attractions. What kind of plants, trees are there? The girl wondered. Best friend, Adriana. On the territory of the Valley of Roses, one of the parts of the park planted more than three dozen species of roses, which fragrant and pleasing to look at. Nancy's mom shared her memories. I don't know about the others. The roses just struck me. Every evening, the Otis family strolled along Kurwurtney Boulevard, passing 400 poplar trees. Despite the fact that the walking area is only half a kilometer long, here is located a huge number of architectural attractions among the architectural structures that attracted the attention of Adriana and Stephen, the old building of the officer's assembly. The former Grand Hotel, which now houses the Narzan Sanatorium, 
as well as the former Podvarita Hotel. Every time they passed by these beautiful buildings, the whole family made up different stories about those who might have lived in these apartments. Thus, three weeks passed. Nancy had successfully completed her treatment and was sent home. She hoped to learn something about her husband, from whom she was still not divorced. But her father and the matchmakers had no information about his whereabouts. Rick only occasionally wrote to his parents, informing them that he was alive and well. Pregnant Camille coped with the oppressive condition every day and was helped a lot by her loved ones. At the 32nd week of pregnancy, Nancy gave birth to a baby boy and named him Noah. The baby was born a sturdy 3 kilograms, 750 grams, and 57 centimeters tall. Grandparents could not be happy with the boy, who was very similar to his father, but Rick everything except the color of his eyes. Mom's, which was extremely surprising, but what only nature will not create. Nancy and her son were greeted from the hospital by the entire Otis family. There was also a friend Lisa, and even Rick's parents arrived on the day of discharge. Time went by very slowly for the young mom. Her mood was great. She was already looking forward to seeing her loved ones and introducing them to the new family members. When Nancy and her son finally went into the room for the discharge, she saw how in an instant the excitement on the face of relatives and friends was replaced by great joy. The parents tried very hard to meet their daughter and grandson in a festive way. So there were flowers and balloons and stickers on the car and a photo session. After arriving home, the baby was placed in a crib on the first floor of the apartment and all the adults went to the dining room to celebrate the discharge at the table. Robert, Kevin and Miranda apologizes for the deed of the son and offers help to the daughter-in-law and grandson. Darling stands up and walks over to Nancy, father-in-law. If you need anything, we are always here to help. We are not giving up on our Noah, putting her arm around her daughter-in-law's shoulders, Miranda said. He's our breed. He's our Schwilly, Schwilly Granson. Thank you. Thank Nancy to her husband's parents. I know you are not to blame for Rick's behavior and do not know where he is, so you don't need to keep apologizing for it. He embarrassed us, said Robert. What he did was wrong. When I get nervous and often say things in my native language, I'm sorry, yes, we noticed, trying to defuse the situation, said Adriana. We will soon speak Georgian ourselves. We already know so many words. And then everyone laughed. Yes, so loudly and resoundingly that woke up Noah, who peacefully advised in the crib. In general, the baby was surprisingly calm. He did not scream, just let his mother sleep. Only when he began to cut his teeth, he became a little cranky. But it quickly passed. During the first few weeks of life, the baby learns to control his body and interact with the world around him. Starting to smile, walk around and reach for objects. Nancy coped well with taking care of the baby, almost without asking for help from her mom depression left the girl. As soon as she saw the face of her Noah lying on her chest in the delivery room, and often took walks with the baby in the park near her home. When the baby fell asleep, she would move to a bench and spend time with a book in the fresh air, here on Lossany Island. On the territory of the former town of Babushkin, there was Babushkinsky Park, in which Nancy sat. She had loved this park since she was a child. It was as if it had been created for leisurely strolls and relaxation all year round. In warm times, little Lulu would ride a horse here, admire the water play of the lights, the musical fountain, and the whole family. Watched a movie in the Summer Theater 5. Now the young mother even had the opportunity to stay on the internet connection with her favorite friends, sitting teenager's tree with Flaubert's favorite novel, Madame Bovary. After all, there's a free Wi-Fi zone. Suddenly Nancy's phone rang and an unfamiliar number popped up on the screen, obviously from another country. Camille thought of calling it, but something made her answer it. She heard her husband's familiar voice in the speaker, and she hung up in fear. Barely holding back tears, Camille tried to stop shaking, but then came a text message from the very number that was now calling. Apparently, you recognized my voice, so you hung up. Yeah, it's me. 
Rick decided to let you know that I'm alive and I'm okay. Of course, I can't write much in the message because I always want to say more in person, looking into your eyes. The only thing I want to write is that I'm sorry. I'm very ashamed that I had to do that, but I had huge problems and I didn't want you to know about them. I want to video call you today to tell you more about it. But if you don't want to talk to me, I understand. I'll call you. And if you don't pick up, I'll never bother you again. She was still not completely calm. She quickly gathered herself, took the stroller, and quickly moved towards the house, where she called her friend to ask her what to do. Still unable to come to a common decision, Nancy decided to listen to her heart and do what it told her to do at that moment. It was lucky her parents weren't home. No one could prevent the girl from having a conversation, should such a thing take place. Taking care of her son, Nancy was able to distract herself a little, but when the phone rang a familiar tune set to video call, she froze in surprise. Taking the phone in her hands, she didn't hesitate long enough to answer it. The painfully familiar face of her beloved husband appeared on the screen. They were silent for a few minutes, then both of them cried. Having calmed down a little, Nancy's husband began to tell what had happened in his life that he had to disappear so suddenly for more than a year. Helping my uncle had caused me to miss almost an entire semester. With a sigh, Rick spoke. To keep me from getting expelled, I had to transfer to a tuition-free program and how to pay for it. It was a shame to ask my parents, so I borrowed money from a loan shark. How did you plan to pay it back? Nancy asked. I thought I'd work and pay it back slowly. But it didn't work out. The interest grew exponentially, and I owed twice as much as I had originally borrowed. I was threatened, beaten. They demanded all the money back at once. They were thugs. Turns out they were. Rick continued the story. Three days after the last warning, you had an accident. Why didn't you take the reward money from your father then? Didn't he offer it to you? Nancy exclaimed in surprise. But I thought I could solve the financial difficulties myself and to take money for a deed that anyone could have done. It's not my policy. When you came to me after a time, I decided to improve my financial situation by marrying you. Young, beautiful, and rich. It was all a lie. Holding back tears, Nancy whispered. Our whole relationship, the words, the vows, the promises, all lies. No, Rick interrupted the girl. At first you just seemed to me a beautiful daughter of rich parents, but then I started to grow attached to you. Our long-distance relationship strengthened my feelings, and my desire to marry you was conscious, and it was based on love for you, not love for money. Why did you leave me? But we would have paid the money and lived happily ever after. When they found out I'd married a rich Otis Harris, they ran up the meter and threatened you. So I figured if I dumped you and gave them the money back, they'd calm down. So I did. I kept some of the money I took from you. I went where? To Turkey to work, said Rick with a smile. Sunny Istanbul for a while working for different companies. Now I run a European-style hotel atelier. I make good money and live well. What happened? That you finally decided to contact me. Nancy asked me a question. I missed you. Trite, but true. And there was a twinge in my chest. A couple months ago, it was like something happened to you. So while I was thinking about it, I decided to call you. It's been almost two months. I want to apologize to you again. I didn't want to abandon you, leave you alone, or cheat on you at all. But at the time, I felt like I had no other choice. Who's crying? Just a second disappeared from the camera view for a moment and returned with little Noah in her arms, who immediately calmed down in her mom's arms. Meet Rick. This is our son, who is almost two months old. Your son, he mumbled confusedly. How does he look like me? Except for your eyes. Yes, that's what everyone says. And I noticed it too. As soon as I saw our boy, how stupid am I? He lamented. Forgive me, Nancy, forgive me if you can. I didn't know you were in there, if I had. I would never have left you alone. 
I didn't know myself. I'm afraid, son, replied Rick's wife was so heartbroken by your act that she didn't immediately realize I was delayed. You have no idea how hard it was for me. I was depressed. I had to go to a sanitarium. And all this while I was pregnant. It's a good thing it was easy. When I gave birth, I was able to come to my senses and completely dissolve in my son, forgetting about you until you called. I'm so sorry, Rick cried. I know you won't forgive me so easily, but I beg you, give me a chance to make it up to you. Come and visit me in Istanbul. I make good money. I live in a separate apartment, and I can take you and our son. I'll come. Nancy said to introduce you to my son and look into your eyes in person. The day after tomorrow, I'll write down the flight number. Don't call me yet. I'll see you later. See you later, Rick said. And he hung up. That same night, Nancy booked her tickets. The flight leaves tomorrow night. After letting her husband know what time and on what flight she would be arriving, Nancy started packing and waiting for her parents at home to break the news. After eight o'clock, Adriana and Stephen came back to the apartment and seeing the suitcases by the front door, immediately thought that something had happened. Camille, her daughter called out, Mom, please come down and explain what the suitcases are in the hallway. The head of the family shouted from the living room, Hi. I'll run down the stairs, threw Nancy to her parents. I just wanted to talk to you like this, said Adriana, taking hold of her heart and sitting down on the sofa. The last time you told us the news, you were getting married. And before that, you were leaving for your lover by deception. I can't take another news like that. I'm leaving this time too. Nancy stated the fact in front of her parents, to Turkey, and more specifically, Istanbul. And yes, I'm going with Noah. I think I'll be gone for a while. And then what happens there? Where? Turkey, Stephen shouted. Have you been to Georgia yet? Look how lucky your husband was to steal from you and throw you in the deep end. Do you want a repeat of the scenario? Daddy, don't yell. Rising to his feet, the young mother tried to calm the parent. I'm not 10 years old to do stupid things with a small child in my arms. I'm going to know his father. Whose father? What kind of father is he? Stephen Otis started to resent him. Wait, how do you know he's there? He called me today and told me everything. I haven't decided if I'm gonna forgive him or not, but it's my duty to introduce my son to his real dad. You're not going anywhere. He wants money from you again. Don't argue with me, Adriana. The man turned to his wife. Say something. Why am I the only one talking to this stupid woman? Stephen. The woman tried to calm her husband. What can you do if she's so determined? Go, baby, if you think it's right. But please, look at the volumes behind the wide open eyes without rose-colored glasses. What are you talking about? Otis is angry at his wife. He left her, and there's no excuse or forgiveness. I always thought his behavior was strange. Sadly, said Adriana, he does not look like a man who can abandon his family. Apparently, something terrible happened and he being a boy made a stupid decision. Thank you, mom, kissed the woman on the cheek. Nancy put her arm around her father's shoulders and ran to her son to feed him. You really think so? Yes, that's exactly what I thought all along. I'm a little shocked, of course. Taking a sip of water, the mom said, Nancy from our daughter's hasty decisions, but we can't stand on our own. It's her life after all. Good thing after that honeymoon trip we put a tracker in her phone. Stephen chuckled, so we'll know where Nancy is. Okay, so much going on in a day, I want to lie down. Can you at least tell me when your flight is? Adriana asked, walking past the bedroom. We'll walk you out. Okay. Good night, threw Nancy to her parents. Good night, sweetie, the older Otis said with glee. From the very morning, Nancy was full of energy and impatience. After all, this day promised to be the beginning of an amazing adventure for her and her son. Throughout the day, Nancy went through her suitcases, making lists of things to bring, making sure she had everything. 
and then the evening before her flight. She had doubts about whether she should go, but the doubt didn't last long. She looked at Noah Nancy and realized she was doing the right thing. Flying to Rick Otis drove her daughter to the airport, 300 hours before the flight. At the airport they checked their luggage and wanted to wait for the flight with Nancy, but she asked them to go home and not worry about her. I am always on the phone reassuring Stephen and Adriana daughter until they agreed. An hour and a half later, Nancy had gone through all the necessary checks and was standing at the front desk. The smile never left her face because she felt on top of the world, holding Kucherov's angels in her arms. When they announced boarding for the flight, Nancy's heart beat faster. She felt like the heroine of a movie who was setting off to meet her dreams. I've already forgiven him, Nancy thought. How could I not forgive him? For I love him. In this uplifted mood and with joyful thoughts, she went up to the cabin of the airplane. The stewardesses smiled welcomingly as they helped the passengers to their seats. In the cabin, there was an atmosphere of coziness and comfort. And the view from the window on snow-white clouds only strengthened the feeling of joy and serene style. Finally, the plane took off and the journey to Istanbul began. Nancy watched the cities and fields, and then the clouds passed beneath them. And with each passing hour her excitement grew. Nancy showed her son what was happening behind the glass, the porthole telling different stories. And when the baby fell asleep, she herself did the same. At the same time, Topaz stood in front of the mirror in his apartment and looked at his reflection, seeing in it only an image of his past life, full of mistakes and regrets. He remembered those times when everything seemed possible and simple, when it seemed that his actions would not affect his future life. But the series of decisions he had made had led to loneliness and emptiness. Now, when halfway there was his wife and son Rick realized that all his mistakes and wrong decisions had left a deep trace in his fate. He couldn't bring back the past and fix everything, but he could start all over again with a clean slate and try to redeem himself and Nancy, whom he had hurt badly. Landing in Turkey was another unforgettable moment for Nancy. When they stepped off the plane, she and Noah were greeted by warm and sunny air filled with the scent of flowers and the sea. Everything around them was so bright and colorful that Nancy couldn't help but smile. As they entered the arrivals area and she began to look for her luggage, she felt someone's gaze on her back. Turning around, Lulu quickly found the familiar, focused look of dark eyes in the welcoming crowd. Her husband, even after a year of separation, was still the same tall, slender man with dark hair only tanned and darker. Rick moved swiftly toward his wife and son and hugged them tightly so embraced. They stood there for several minutes not knowing what to say to each other. They silently picked up their luggage and moved towards the exit. That's how the little journey to Istanbul began, where every day was filled with new adventures, meetings, conversations, and unforgettable experiences. Although there were many more discoveries and adventures ahead, Nancy knew that this trip would be remembered forever and would be a pivotal one in their married life. He brought the family to his apartment overlooking the Bosphorus. There he took his son in his arms and he began to walk around happily, as if he realized that it was his father. Rick played with the baby for a long time and Nancy silently observed this family idol. She asked if he had somewhere to put the boy to sleep, to which Rick silently pulled out a crib from behind the screen door. The furniture was obviously new. He must have bought it. Yesterday fought Nancy, Stella, and the crib to the favorite blankets Rick's parents had given her as she put the infant to bed, pre-fed him. She and her husband went to the kitchen to talk in the Turkish man's apartment. The kitchen was not just a place to prepare food, but a cozy corner to spend warm evenings. The walls were painted a delicate shade of ivory, creating an atmosphere of warmth and tranquility. In the center of the kitchen was a large wooden table, and small chairs stood around the table. Natural wood upholstered a floral print fabric on which Nancy and Rick sat across from each other. She glanced around the walls and noticed an antique clock, which with its end reminded her of the quickness of personality and time, and the need to appreciate every moment. 
Next to the clock was a painting depicting a summer landscape. It added freshness and brightness to the kitchen. I wonder if he thought he had purchased it himself, or if it was already hanging here. Casting a glance at the huge old gas boiler that took up most of the kitchen, it was unkept, even shabby, and reminded Nancy of the times when whole families would gather around it to keep warm and share news. Nancy interrupted the girl's musings. Rick, thank you for your son. Thank you for keeping the pregnancy alive. I realize you could have terminated it, being full of resentment towards me. Forgive me, forgive me, please, I'm so sorry. In this year, I've grown, matured both physically and mentally. On my way to you before I even got on the plane, I realized I had forgiven you the moment I decided to pick up the phone when you called on the video link. Nancy rushed over to hug and kiss his spouse. Man, I didn't even expect you to be able to forgive me. Okay, let's close this topic and discuss our future, Nancy suggested, smiling. If you are ready to build it with us, with Noah, are you still hesitating? Rick was surprised. If I wasn't ready to build my future with you, I would never call you again. And the fact that we have a son has strengthened my desire to redeem myself to you is a good thing. But how are we going to live here or go back to Moscow? I'm not ready to live here permanently. I have a couple of business ideas and a friend with whom we're preparing a startup. If everything works out, the business will be here and I can live anywhere in the world. What's the idea? Nancy wondered. I'm not telling you yet, and I'm not taking money from you. I have yet to get back what I took from you to fully restore my trust. But I don't want to live in Moscow either. I'm sorry. The big metropolis is not for me. I propose to think and move to a place where we both will be comfortable and where Noah will have a place to run and grow up happily, exclaimed. If we live somewhere other than Moscow, then only there, where we met where we were happy, where your homeland is, where there are boundless fields, where there are boundless landscapes, where we will be happy. Exactly. So you agree with my idea? Sure, honey, I'll go to the end of the world with you, but not to Moscow. Not Moscow, Rick laughed. I'll fly to Russia with you to talk to your parents and apologize to them. Then I'll come back to settle things. In the meantime, you choose a house in Polizzi, where we'll move to, we'll rent, and then we'll buy our own. No, Nancy interrupted her husband's speech. We'll buy a house at once. I have money for it. I don't want to live in someone else's house and move from place to place several times. All right, if it's more convenient for you, let's do it that way. But I'll buy everything for the house. All right, as you say conciliatory, said Nancy and tonight we'll go for a walk. You can show me and my son all the interesting things in Istanbul. One day won't be enough for us, so we'll stay here for a couple of days. We just have to tell our parents. I'm so glad, said Rick, lifting his wife in his arms. What are you doing here? Nancy warned her parents that she would stay in Turkey for a week and then fly back with her husband. Stephen and Adriana weren't surprised but they didn't let it show. Rick took some time off work to show all the beauties of Istanbul to his family. On the first day, they took the most popular route with a tour of the main attractions of Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque. Rick chose to travel by sea streetcars along the Bosphorus Strait. When they arrived at the pier as a family, they were the ones facing a 20-minute climb through the narrow streets of old Istanbul. Better to walk to get a sense of the city's atmosphere. Nancy was convinced by her husband when he suggested walking. After the walk, the travelers found themselves in the first part of the most important square of the city, Sultan Ahmed. This part consists of small squares with fountains and is surrounded on two sides by the main sites of Istanbul, Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque. The mosque made a big impression on Nancy. Rick told her that it is the first mosque in Istanbul which is more than 400 years old, and it got its name because of the huge number of white and blue handmade pottery from Rostov. The whole family spent a long time wandering around both the temple and the mosque. Nancy had to dig around for now, otherwise she would not be allowed to visit the holy places. The next day they went to Golhan Park, 
It is worth visiting because it is April, and this is the season of blossoms. Tulipanov told the previous night of Rick's wife. So Nancy learned that the capital of these flowers is not Holland, but Turkey. The husband knew so many interesting facts about this amazing country, which did not cease to amaze the girl. Tulips are the symbol of Turkey and favorite flower Sultanov told, walking through the park Rick. Even the name he came up with here, and it comes from the name of the fabric for Turkish chumps. Honey, noticing the beds of roses, asked Nancy. It's not just tulips that grow in the park. How long has this park been here? It's practically the center of town. Yes, Jeanette's Vale. Taking his wife by the hand and stroking his son, who is in slang on the head, continued the story Rick Goal. KP is the oldest park in Istanbul. Look over there is the Topkapi Palace complex. We're going there the other day and the park was once part of the palace. The name translates into Russian as the Palace of Roses. In the spring and summer, it has over 80,000 roses in bloom, which are perfectly juxtaposed with gorgeous tulip beds. They ended their walk at the Ataturk Monument to the first president of the Turkish Republic. Their Noah's parents looked at the waves of the Bosphorus and made plans for a happy future where their family would grow. And the boy was getting brothers and sisters. During the week, Nancy saw many interesting things in Turkey. She visited many sites, among them Takapi Palace, Sulimani Mosque, Maiden Tower, Cistern, Basilica, and many others. Before returning home, she was very nervous because she did not know how Rick's conversation with her parents would go, and more importantly, how his meeting with his parents would go. Robert was very scolding and spoke in Georgian expressing to his son his dissatisfaction with his behavior. When they arrived in Moscow, they immediately went to Lena's apartment to meet her parents. Stephen and Adriana were already waiting for them, having sent Christopher and Molly to the birthday party of a neighbor boy. Otis, the head of the family, was very nervous and couldn't find a place to be, not knowing how to behave with a son-in-law who behaved like that. His wife told him to calm down and listen to everything Rick had to say and only then decide whether to forgive him or not. He wanted to answer his wife, but not before the key turned in the door and they heard the familiar voice of his daughter and the shout of his grandson's shadow. A moment later, a tan Nancy appeared in the doorway, holding Noah in her arms, and behind her stood frozen in indecision. Rick, holding their luggage in both hands. Hello, daughter. Adriana broke the awkward silence. How did you get here? Hi, mom. At the parent and handing her grandchild to her, Nancy said, we arrived well, without incident. We have a lot of news for you, and most importantly, gifts. I can see that without incident, said Stephen contemptuously. Everyone made it. No one got lost. No one disappeared. Daddy Stephen, Adriana said warningly. Hello, Rick. I'm sorry about your husband. He's very worried as we all are, but we're ready to listen to you. Hello, greeted the son-in-law of his wife's parents, closing the door and inviting them into the living room. I won't talk long. There is no excuse for what I did. I know that Nancy has told you the reasons for my actions, but that in no way excuses me. I am a man, and this behavior is unbecoming. That's a good point made by Stephen Otis. I do not even hope for your forgiveness, but I will try to restore faith in me as a worthy spouse of your daughter. Turning to his father-in-law, Rick said I will return all the money I stole from Nancy. Not immediately, of course, but within a year. Mom, Dad, Nancy entered the conversation. We decided to move to Belize, buy a house and live there as a family, build our lives independently. Wait. Dumbfounded by the news, Stephen tried to understand how it was so quickly made another decision of the daughter. You have not had time to reconcile with him and are already making plans for the future, but he'll give me back the money he stole. Let him be thankful I didn't report him. And then what? How will you be alone in another country? Adriana asked, playing with her grandson. Who will help you? I'm a big girl, especially as a mom answered Nancy. We'll help each other, especially since Rick is about to start a small business in Turkey, and I've wanted to write books for a long time, 
and I've already started taking notes to write some fairy tales for children. And we won't be in Georgia. One hugged his wife by the shoulders, Marlow remarked. My parents have settled there, who have retired and will no longer disappear on business trips. My uncle lives there, who, despite his age, will be happy to babysit his grandson. It's nature, mountain air, and Maya and Noah's little homeland. The conversation between Otis and Marlowe continued for several more hours. With each new remark, the attitude towards Rick changed for the better. But Stephen still feared for his daughter's feelings. He suggested they draw up a prenuptial agreement, which the young parents agreed to. And Rick also offered to write a receipt that he would return the money to his wife's father. By the end of the day, the younger Otis children returned and were happy to see their sister and nephew. And little Molly was even glad to see Rick, not understanding why Christopher was staring at Nancy Marlowe's husband like that, realizing that it was necessary to explain himself to his wife's brother as well, took him to the dining room and there told him everything he thought necessary. After hearing a lot of negativity and threats in response, Rick silently offered his hand for a handshake and the teenager shook it, thus showing that forgiveness is possible. That same day, the man went to his parents' house to hesitate in front of the apartment that Robert Kevin and Miranda rented every time they stayed in Moscow. He gathered his thoughts before he pressed the bell. The door was opened by his father, and he silently disappeared into the gloom of the apartment. Rick crossed the threshold, closed the door and followed his father. There in one of the rooms his parents were already waiting for him. There were no hugs, caresses and kisses from his mom which made the young man very sad. Looking at his mother who was crying, turning away from her son, Rick realized that she was fighting her desire to hug him. Appearing, Robert interrupted the silence. Kevin Ivick, and to you hello father, don't you dare call me that. Order's cold tone pronounced Daddy Rick. After what you have done, you are not my son. Robert pleaded with the young man's mother. You can't do that. He's the only one. No, Miranda contradicted Robert's wife. You can't leave your wife in a foreign country on her honeymoon. You can't steal money. You can't leave your parents. You can't disappear without giving any news. And who did that? Who violated? You can't do that much. But that's our ex-son. Father, I realize I'm to blame. Don't you understand anything? Robert Kevin cut off his son's sentence in mid-sentence. You're not just to blame. Rick, you've dishonored me, my mother, my wife, and subsequently your son. I didn't mean to. As the Marlowe couple's son fell to his knees and began to sob, I wasn't thinking about what I was doing. I wanted to sort out my financial difficulties and start a new life. I thought I didn't love my wife, but I was wrong. I didn't know Nancy was pregnant. God. I didn't know anything, I didn't even realize the consequences. Son came up to Rick's mother and put her arm around his shoulders. There in the foreign land I felt like I was king of the world. In my life began a new chapter, continued to confess to his parents Rick. But once the realization came that money still had to be made, and I was so smart there, I wasn't the only one who realized I had done something stupid. And when came the realization that I missed Nancy and my parents, I began to think how to reappear in your lives and how to ask for forgiveness. It should ask first of all from my wife. In a calm voice said Robert Kevin Ivick, who silently listened to the speech of his son. If she can forgive, then the others will try. I have already forgiven, said Miranda, wiping away her tears. You're my son, for what it's worth. And Camille has forgiven me, Rick said quietly, even though I don't deserve it. She's a good woman, a wonderful mother, and as you can see, a wise wife, praised his daughter-in-law, the young man's father. She should be memorialized. After all you've done, she was able to forgive you. I agree, raising his eyes to his father. Rick said, I'll try to get your respect back. I know it's gonna be hard. We'll see, the man said conciliatingly. Now tell me, what are your plans with Nancy? The next conversation with my parents took place in a more cozy family atmosphere. They sat on the sofa, and the son in the armchair opposite them. They talked about various things, 
but the main topic was Rick's life in Turkey and his successes. His parents asked him about his job, his family, and his future plans. He was happy to answer their questions and share his plans. A young man and told them about their solid dreams and goals. Both Robert Kevin and Miranda were happy to hear about it. They supported him in all his endeavors and promised to help if needed. At the end of the conversation, the parents wished their son good luck and said they would always be there to help him. After the heart-to-heart -heart talk with his parents, it was as if a stone had been removed from Rick's heart. Still, how important it is to be close to your parents. It's like you're incomplete without them. He thought on the way back to his hotel. After a couple of days, Rick had to return to Turkey to settle things, start a business with a friend, quit the hotel, rent an apartment, landlord, and send his things to Moscow. Marlo himself moved into the hotel for the days when his presence was needed to organize the startup and initial tracking of the business. All the while, Rick missed his family madly. He was on the phone with, and many times a day always via video call. He wanted to see both his son and his wife. Nancy, for her part, was looking for the right house for them, constantly sending options to her husband and discussing different purchase offers with her parents. Since Rick had to stay longer, he sent his wife a power of attorney to purchase the property. I drove with my father to Belize to buy the dream house, leaving my son in the care of his grandmother. The cab stopped near a red brick fence, behind which you can see a house of light stone, decorated with a mosaic of multicolored from posts, which glistened in the sun and shimmered with all the colors of the rainbow. Relaxing with the driver, Nancy and her father walked to the wicket beyond which awaited them the dream house they had purchased, which still had yet to be furnished, as Stephen had not yet seen the interior decoration. The daughter had decided to show her father just after the deal was done what was in her house. The first thing the man noted was that the lot was surrounded by green hills, and in the courtyard, vines were tightly intertwined with metal structures, creating several conversations in which it would be nice to hide from the sun on a hot summer day. Stephen, what a beautiful house. You've already seen it in pictures, haven't you? Nancy laughed. We've driven by it. You've looked at it a few times. Oh, my darling. It's one thing to look at a photo and speed past it. The man smirked and took a seat on a bench in one of the great conversations. It's another to experience this atmosphere amongst the beauty in such a distinctive country. I agree with that. Dad, let's go inside. The view from the living room window is amazing. Come on, you intrigue me. And father and daughter started toward the house, following the paving stones across the spacious yard. Nancy was talking nonstop about the plants growing on the property, but Stephen's attention was attracted by a small fountain, which was located in one corner of the Grand Palace. Stopping at it, the man listened to the book murmur the tea of water that gave peace and coolness. Turning toward the house, Otis saw that Camille had opened the dark wood front door with an intricately patterned door, above which hung a large wrought iron lantern. As he approached the house, he noticed two large cypress trees standing like guards on either side of the entrance, guarding the peace and comfort of the house's occupants. Inside the house, there was plenty of space and light, the large windows were decorated with carved wooden shutters. The walls were sewn with wooden panels, and the floors were laid with noble wood, which gave the building the atmosphere of an old castle with a long history. In the living room, which was the center of the first floor, there was a large fireplace made of natural stone. There were comfortable armchairs and sofas, where you could relax after a long day or warm yourself on cold winter evenings. The windows near the fireplace overlooked the backyard, where a large garden with fruit trees and vineyards. Along the paths leading to the garden were wooden benches, inviting you to relax and enjoy the beauty of the surrounding nature. The house was full of light and warmth spacious and cozy. It reminded of the traditions and customs of ancient Georgia, filling the hearts of Nancy and Stephen with the joy of harmony and hope for the marital happiness that awaited Rick and Noah. Within these walls, the daughter exclaimed with wonder at Stephen. It's really beautiful. It's a view you just sit back and enjoy. 
and the whole day is not an evening. And the satisfied Nancy plumped down in the chair and offered to sit in the neighboring chair. When I saw these landscapes that opened from the windows of the house, I was even stronger in the decision to buy it. Did Rick see it for himself? No, I whispered cryptically. I haven't even shown him a picture. In case he does not like it. Surprised the girl's father. Such a house with a view of the mountains and a huge home garden. I doubt it. Standing up from the chair and coming close to the window, Nancy continued. Especially since he said he trusts me completely. That's nice. Come on, let's go and show you the second floor, Stephen Otis suggested. Let's go. A month after buying the house, the Marlowe family moved in completely. Nancy from Moscow brought a lot of things for herself and her son. And Rick from Turkey brought a lot of original interior decorations and several carpets that decorated the living room bedroom and two children's rooms. The couple had not yet finished decorating the guest rooms as they were in a hurry to move. They still had to completely unpack, organize the living room and kitchen, as well as fix a few benches in the yard and get a dog. Rick really liked the house his spouse had chosen. He admired the new house and felt comfortable and cozy in it. He couldn't wait to start a new life in it, thought Rick, hugging his wife on the doorstep of their family nest. Every evening they walked around Valise, spent cozy sit-downs by the fireplace, admiring their garden and rejoicing at Noah's first steps and words. Rick loved to look at his wife, shrouded in a halo of tenderness and grace. Her movements were always fluid and graceful, as if she were floating on the ground rather than walking. Hair in soft waves, not falling on her shoulders, dwarfed the face, emphasizing its refined features. Eyes deep and penetrating looked at her son with kindness and wisdom. Around Nancy hovered an atmosphere of calmness and peace, as if the wife was a source of light and warmth for all who were near. Her presence made Tamara and Noah feel cozy and safe, and they felt protected and happy. Nancy felt strange, and couldn't tell if it was from the euphoria and happiness, from the move, or was it health-related. After sending her husband and son for a walk, she had taken a pregnancy test and was now sitting on the couch with her eyes wide open in surprise, holding the positive pregnancy test in her hands, and her heart was racing. She couldn't believe it. After all, they hadn't planned to have another baby so soon. But the news was unexpected and at the same time very joyful. After all, the dreams of a big family were becoming a reality. She felt overwhelmed with happiness and excitement for how Rick would react to the news. Going for a walk, father and son decided to have a great time. Rick is tall, slender, and was dressed in lightweight long pants and a shirt. And Noah, small and energetic, was in bright shorts and a t-shirt with the image of his favorite cartoon character. They stepped out of the house, and a world full of possibilities and adventure opened up before them. The air was fresh and cool, filled with the scent of flowers and herbs. The father was telling his son about the different things that surrounded them. The one-year-old didn't understand everything, but he enjoyed every moment with his dad. Rick showed Noah trees, flowers, and birds, and explained how they lived and what they did. As they walked, they came to a park where there were many playgrounds and rides. There they enjoyed riding on the slides and swings. The father watched his son with a smile on his face, delighted with his happiness and energy. Eventually, the evening was coming to an end, and they returned home, tired but happy. This walk was a special memory for them that Rick will hold in his heart for the rest of his life. Upon returning home, Rick noticed his wife's nervousness and her desire to hide from him. But while she fed her son and put him to bed, he decided not to broach the subject. Rick's parents were happy. And now we have to go, getting up from the chair, said Robert. Kevin Iovich, goodbye. Goodbye, dad and mom said goodbye. Nancy, escorting her husband's parents to the door. Rick escorted the guests out, coming. Called back the spouse from the kitchen on New Year's Eve, all Otis and Senior Marlowe came over for the holiday long weekend, Kaline and Rick, 
They decorated a large Christmas tree in the backyard with colorful balls, garland, and tinsel. On top of it was a bright star that sparkled against the dark sky. The tree was decorated with great taste and love. Each element of decoration was carefully selected and harmoniously combined with the rest. The balls were of different sizes and colors from small, silver to large golden garlands glowed with multicolored lights, creating an atmosphere of festivity and magic. The meeting of the new year was stormy and joyful. Everyone was happy. Everyone was playing and wanted to rest not only their bodies but also their souls, which they did very well. Three months after the new year, the first cry of Edery Marlowe, whom her parents were waiting for, was heard in the Tbilisi Maternity Hospital. They had long ago decorated the second nursery, decorating it in a delicate pink light. Fairy tale characters and beautiful flowers were drawn on the walls. In the corner of the room stood a small white crib decorated with lace and boughs. Next to the crib was a nightstand, on which there were soft toys and rattles. The floor was covered with a fluffy carpet, so that the baby could crawl and play on it in the future, and on the window hung curtains of transparent fabric, through which the sunlight penetrated, making the room even more cozy. When night came, the stars lit up the dark sky, the young family gathered around the cradle of their newborn baby. They looked at him with love and tenderness, as if he were the most precious treasure in the world. As they lifted little Noah up and introduced him to his sister, Nancy, and Rick could not be overjoyed at their happiness. The room was quiet, with only the sleeping baby's quiet breathing barely audible to the young parents. The parents smiled as they looked at Eteri and hugged their eldest son tightly. They knew that their love and care would protect them from all the troubles and dangers that might come their way. So they stood with their lives bent over the cradle and looked at their little miracle that had brought so much joy and happiness into their lives. They realized that their lives would now be filled with new worries and joys, but they were ready for it. After all, what could be better than loving and caring for their babies? Darling, setting his son down on the floor and taking his hand, Rick spoke on his way to the older child's room. I'm so excited to get to see the first few months of our daughter's life. I'm glad to have you around this time too. Nancy hugged her husband. I can't stop berating myself for abandoning you then, leaving you in that position, forcing you to make the difficult decision to carry alone to give birth without your husband. Putting you to sleep, Noah kept whispering to his wife, Rick, I will never get tired of apologizing to you. Don't. Covering the door to his son's room, he snuggled into his husband's chest. Nancy, don't take old wounds. It's all in the past. Now you're around, and we're happy. Yes, we are happy, and we always will be. Rick gave his wife a big tight hug. So idyllically, they went to their room 40 days after the baby girl was born. Under the roof of Nancy and Rick's house, a noisy crowd of relatives and close friends had gathered for Eteri's viewing party. The girl's parents invited all their near and dear ones to share the joy and show off their dark-haired and black-eyed and beautiful baby girl. The living room was decorated with balloons and garlands. Soft, quiet music was playing in the background, and a rich table was set in the center with vases of flowers in addition to food. Next to the fireplace was the small round crib where Terry also slept, snug in a soft blanket tied by her grandmother, Adriana. The guests approached the crib quietly, almost silently. To look at the baby and wish her health and happiness, they each brought a gift of a toy, clothes, books, or money. Nancy and Rick were happy to have such a celebration to share their joy with their loved ones and create memories that would be cherished for a lifetime. Thus began a new, but by no means the last chapter in the life of Nancy, Rick, Noah, and Ituri. The young couple's dream of a large family didn't remain just a dream. Seven children were born into their family. Rick worked tirelessly, developing Turkish business and opening branches in Russia. Nancy wrote fairy tales for children, which were so well liked by one publishing house that it signed a contract with her and began to publish them in impressive editions. The children grew up to the delight of their parents, 
They were friendly and loved each other on all holidays in their house gathered a noisy crowd, where everyone was a relative or close friend. Each year, the number of people invited grew. Christopher got married, grew older. Molly changed boyfriends often, looking for her man. Lisa married and had two children. And Stephen and Adriana Otis unexpectedly had John. And all of them. The friendly Marlowe family was always a pleasure to have in our home.